In my last couple of videos, we have been covering what happens after a star dies. And it largely depends on the amount of mass the star has when this happens. For stars with 20 times the mass of our sun, or more, they collapse into a stellar mass black hole. For stars with 10 or so times the mass of our sun, they collapse into neutron stars. But what happens when a star with the mass of our sun, or a star even up to about 8 times as much as it has, collapses? This results in what we know as a white dwarf star. This is Cup of Science Joe, and today, that is the very thing we're going to cover. We will touch on some of the features we may see in a white dwarf star, a little bit of what might happen to our solar system during the process of this happening, along with some other fun facts as well. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Now before we continue into white dwarfs, let's first cover what would cause the sun or a star to reach the end of its life. For heavier stars, this process has some different steps and ends in a supernova, but for stars like our sun, it will not reach that point. Now, to sustain itself, a star is constantly undergoing nuclear fusion. The energy from this fusion is what pushes outward against gravity that's trying to collapse the star in, thus keeping it stable. But as we all know, there is no such thing as an infinite energy source. Currently, our sun is fusing hydrogen into helium. Now in about five or so billion years, it will run out of this hydrogen. But unlike the larger stars, the more massive stars, it will not begin fusing, fusing helium yet. Instead, it will move outwards and begin to fuse hydrogen around the core. When this happens, energy production increases tremendously, causing the sun to swell up in size and entering into its red giant phase, which we think is going to last about a billion years. At this point, the inner planets, including Earth, will likely be swallowed up, so not great news for us. But like the phase before it, and as I mentioned a little bit before, this too is finite. Once the sun reaches its maximum size and has likely run through its hydrogen, it is at this point that it will begin to fuse its helium. This happens in pulses, right? With each pulse resulting in significant loss of mass. And this mass loss is one of the things that can actually result in a planetary nebula, such as the ring nebula seen here. This trend will continue until there is no fuel left for the sun to fuse. And having lost much of its mass, what we have left behind is a smaller cooling core known as a white dwarf star. So like we said, once the outer material of the star has been ejected, forming a planetary nebula, the hot core still remains. This core is effectively what becomes the white dwarf star. The core usually exceeds 100,000 Kelvin or 180,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's still hot, but not compared to how hot it was when it was fusing. Because this fusion has ceased at this stage, the core will only cool from here. The only exception I could find to this is if there's a nearby star it can accrete matter from, and we'll talk a little bit about this sort of scenario later, but in the case of our sun, this most likely will not be the case. Because of this cooling, many nearby white dwarfs have been detected as low energy x-rays and even higher energy ultraviolet rays as they steadily lower in energy and pass through the electromagnetic spectrum. Observations taken in these wavelengths have become a powerful tool in studying the composition and structure of these stars and their thin atmosphere. 
Now, because, as we mentioned before, white dwarfs are no longer undergoing fusion, they have lost the ability to create the internal pressure that they did when they were a normal star. Gravity will compact their matter inward until even the electrons composing the white dwarf's atoms are smashed together. Now, normally, identical electrons, or those with the same spin, cannot occupy the same energy level. And since there are only two ways an electron can spin, this usually results in only two electrons occupying an energy level. But in a white dwarf, the density is much higher. And as a result of that, all of the electrons end up much closer to each other. This is referred to as a degenerate gas, meaning that all the energy levels in its atoms are filled to the brim with electrons. Now for gravity to compress the white dwarf any further, it would call for electrons to go places where they simply cannot. So once the star is degenerate, gravity cannot compress it anymore, meaning that the white dwarf survives, not by internal fusion, but by quantum mechanical properties that prevent it from totally collapsing completely. Degenerate matter has other unusual properties too. For example, the more massive a white dwarf is, the smaller it is in size. This is because the more mass a white dwarf has, the more its electrons must squeeze together to maintain enough outward pressure to support that extra mass. There is a limit to this though. The highest amount of mass a white dwarf can have is about 1.4 times that of our sun. Now, let's talk a little bit about the atmosphere of a white dwarf as well. With surface gravity of 100,000 times stronger than that of Earth, their atmosphere becomes very strange. The heavier atoms sink and the lighter ones remain on the surface. Some white dwarfs have almost pure hydrogen or helium atmospheres, which are the lightest elements. And gravity pulls their atmosphere close around them into a thin layer. If Earth were doing the same thing, the top of its atmosphere would be below the tops of our skyscrapers. Scientists have also hypothesized that there is a crust 50 kilometer thick or so below the atmosphere of many white dwarfs, and at the bottom of this crust is a crystalline lattice of carbon and oxygen atoms. Since diamond is just crystallized carbon, one might compare a cooled white dwarf star and to a large diamond. All right, now that we know a little bit about what a white dwarf is, let's turn our attention back to the year 1844. Yes, this happens to be when the first white dwarf star was discovered. This discovery was made by astronomer Frederick Bessel when he was observing the star Sirius, which we find in the constellation Canis Major. He noticed that Sirius had a slight back and forth motion, as if it was orbiting an unseen object, right? Like as if it was a binary. Then in 1863, optician and telescope maker Alvin Clark spotted this mysterious object. The companion star to Sirius was later determined to be a white dwarf. The system has quite a long orbital period though, being 50 years long. We have a lot of these in our Milky Way as well. While it is nearly impossible to see and know all the stars in our galaxy, the current estimate suggests that there are about 10 billion white dwarfs in the Milky Way galaxy, making them far more common than both black holes and neutron stars. I think it would be safe to say that the same trend is true across the rest of the universe as well. We have all probably heard the phrase, nothing lasts forever. And this is even true of the stars in our sky. And while none of us will have to worry about this in our own solar system anytime soon, 
I find it exciting that our galaxy and universe are fast enough for us to have the ability to study these things. I find it exciting that our galaxy and universe are vast enough for us to have the ability to study these things. This will also conclude our little series covering the outcomes of stellar death. And I really hope you've been as intrigued by it as I have. This is Cup of Science Joe, and I implore you to step outside tonight and look towards the stars.